Section 13 of Inca Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Inca Lands by Hiram Bingham. Chapter 7, Part 2. The southern rim of the Cusco Basin is broken by no very striking peaks, although Huanacaray, 13,427 feet, the highest point, is connected in Inca tradition with some of the principal festivals and religious celebrations. The north side of the Huatane Valley is much more irregular, ranging from Tica Tica Pass, 12,000 feet, to Mount Pachatuxa, 15,915 feet, whose five little peaks are frequently snow-clad. There is no permanent snow either here or elsewhere in the Huatane Valley. The people of the Cusco Basin are very short of fuel. There is no native coal. What the railroad uses comes from Australia. Firewood is scarce. The ancient forests disappeared long ago. The only trees in sight are a few willows or poplars from Europe and one or two groves of eucalyptus, also from Australia. Cusco has been thought of and written of as being above the tree line, but such is not the case. The absence of trees on the neighboring hills is due entirely to the hand of man, the long occupation, the necessities of early agriculturists who cleared the forests before the days of intensive terrace agriculture, and the firewood requirements of a large population. The people of Cusco do not dream of having enough fuel to make their houses warm and comfortable. Only with difficulty can they get enough for cooking purposes. They depend largely on faggots and straw which are brought into town on the backs of men and animals. In the fields of stubble left from the wheat and barley harvest, we saw many sheep feeding. They were thin and long-legged, and many of the rams had four horns, apparently due to centuries of inbreeding and the failure to improve the original stock by the introduction of new and superior strains. When one looks at the great amount of arable slopes on most of the hills of the Cusco Basin and the unusually extensive flat land near the Huatane, one readily understands why the heart of Inca land witnessed a concentration of population very unusual in the Andes. Most of the important ruins are in the northwest quadrant of the basin, either in the immediate vicinity of Cusco itself or on the Pampas, north of the city. The reason is that the arable lands where most extensive potato cultivation could be carried out are nearly all in this quadrant. In the midst of this potato country, at the foot of the pass that leads directly to Pisac and Paucartambo, is a picturesque ruin which bears the native name of Pucara. Pucara is the Quichua word for fortress, and it needs but one glance at the little hilltop crowned with a rectangular fortification to realize that the term is justified. The walls are beautifully made of irregular blocks closely fitted together. Advantage was taken of small cliffs on two sides of the hill to strengthen the fortifications. We noticed openings or drains which had been cut in the wall by the original builders in order to prevent the accumulation of moisture on the terraced floor of the enclosed area, which is several feet above that of the sloping field outside. Similar conduits may be seen in many of the old walls in the city of Cusco. Apparently, the ancient folk fully appreciated the importance of good drainage and took pains to secure it. At present, Pucara is occupied by Yama herdsmen and drovers, who find the enclosure a very convenient corral. Probably Pucara was built by the chief of a tribe of prehistoric herdsmen who raised root crops and kept their flocks of yamas and alpacas on the neighboring grassy slopes. A short distance up the stream of the Kaya Chaka above Pucara is a warm mineral spring. Around it is a fountain of cut stone. Nearby are the ruins of a beautiful terrace, on top of which is a fine wall containing four large ceremonial niches, level with the ground and about six feet high. The place is now called Tampu Makai, Polo de Odengardo, 
who lived in Cusco in 1560, while many of the royal family of the Incas were still alive, gives a list of the sacred or holy places which were venerated by all the Indians in those days. Among these, he mentions that of Timpucpuquio, the hot springs near Tambo Macay, called so from the manner in which the water boils up. The next, Huaca, or holy place, he mentions, is Tambo Macay itself, a house of the Inca Yupanqui, where he was entertained when he went to be married. It was placed on a hill near the road over the Andes. They sacrificed everything here except children. The stonework of the ruins here is so excellent in character, the ashlars being very carefully fitted together, one may fairly assume a religious origin for the place. The Quichua word mokini means to wash, or to rinse a large narrow-mouthed pitcher. It may be that at Tampu Makai, ceremonial purification of utensils devoted to royal or priestly uses was carried on. It is possible that this is the place where, according to Molina, all the youths of Cusco, who had been armed as knights in the great November festival, came on the 21st day of the month to bathe and change their clothes. Afterwards, they returned to the city to be lectured by their relatives. Each relation that offered a sacrifice flogged a youth and delivered a discourse to him, exhorting him to be valiant and never to be a traitor to the sun and the Inca, but to imitate the bravery and prowess of his ancestors. Tampu Makai is located on a little bluff above the Calla Chaca, a small stream which finally joins the Huatane near the town of San Sebastian. Before it reaches the Huatane, the Calla Chaca joins the Cachimayo, famous as being so highly impregnated with salt as to have caused the rise of extensive salt works. In fact, the Pizarros named the place Las Salinas, or the Salt Pits, on account of the salt pans with which, by a careful system of terracing, the natives had filled the Chaquimayo Valley. Prescott describes the great battle which took place here on April 26, 1539, between the forces of Pizarro and Almagro, the two leaders who had united for the original conquest of Peru, but quarreled over the division of the territory. Near the salt pans are many Inca walls and the ruins of structures with niches called Rumihuasi, or Stone House. The presence of salt in many of the springs of the Huatane Valley was a great source of annoyance to our topographic engineers, who were frequently obliged to camp in districts where the only water available was so saline as to spoil it for drinking purposes and ruin the tea. The Cusco Basin was undoubtedly once the site of a lake, an ancient water body whose surface, says Professor Gregory, lay well above the present site of San Sebastian and San Geronimo. This lake is believed to have reached its maximum expansion in early Pleistocene times. Its rich silts, so well adapted for raising maize, habas beans, and quinoa, have always attracted farmers and are still intensively cultivated. It has been named Lake Morkill in honor of that loyal friend of scientific research in Peru, William L. Morkill, Esquire, without whose untiring aid we could never have brought our Peruvian exploration as far along as we did. In pre-glacial times, Lake Morkill fluctuated in volume. From time to time, parts of the shore were exposed long enough to enable plants to send their roots into the fine materials and the sun to bake and crack the muds. Mastodons grazed on its banks. Lake Morkill probably existed during all or nearly all of the glacial epoch. Its drainage was finally accomplished by the Huatane, cutting down the sandstone hills near Seya and developing the Angostura Gorge. In the banks of the Huatane, a short distance below the city of Cusco, the stratified beds of the vanished Lake Morkill today contain many fossil shells. Above these are gravels brought down by the floods and landslides of more modern times, in which may be found potsherds and bones. One of the chief affluents of the Huatane is the Chunchuyamayo, Mayo, 
which cuts off the southernmost third of Cusco from the center of the city. Its banks are terraced and are still used for gardens and food crops. Here, the hospitable Canadian missionaries have their pleasant station, a veritable oasis of Anglo-Saxon cleanliness. On a July morning in 1911, while strolling up the Ayahuaico Quebrada, an affluent of the Chunchuyumayo, in company with Professor Foote and Surgeon Irving, my interest was aroused by the sight of several bones and potsherds exposed by recent erosion in the stratified gravel banks of the Little Gulch. Further examination showed that recent erosion had also cut through an ancient ash heap. On the side toward Cusco, I discovered a section of stone wall, built of roughly finished stones, more or less carefully fitted together, which at first sight appeared to have been built to prevent further washing away of that side of the gulch. Yet above the wall, and flush with its surface, the bank appeared to consist of stratified gravel, indicating that the wall antedated the gravel deposits. Fifty feet farther up the Quebrada, another portion of the wall appeared under the gravel bank. On top of the bank was a cultivated field. Half an hour's digging in the compact gravel showed that there was more wall underneath the field. Later investigation by Dr. Bowman showed that the wall was about three feet thick and nine feet in height. Carefully faced on both sides with roughly cut stone and filled in with rubble a type of stonework not uncommon in the foundations of some of the older buildings in the western part of the city of cusco even at first sight it was obvious that this wall built by man was completely covered to a depth of six or eight feet by a compact water-laid gravel bank this was sufficiently difficult to understand yet a few days later while endeavoring to solve the puzzle i found something even more exciting half a mile farther up the gulch the road newly cut ran close to the compact perpendicular gravel bank about five feet above the road i saw what looked like one of the small rocks which are freely interspersed throughout the gravels here closer examination showed it to be the end of a human femur apparently it formed an integral part of the gravel bank which rose almost perpendicularly for seventy or eighty feet above it Impressed by the possibilities, in case it should turn out to be true, that here, in the heart of Inca land, a human bone had been buried under 75 feet of gravel, I refrained from disturbing it until I could get Dr. Bowman and Professor Foote, the geologist and the naturalist of the 1911 expedition, to come with me to the Ayahuaico Quebrada. We excavated the femur and found behind it fragments of a number of other bones. They were excessively fragile the femur was unable to support more than four inches of its own weight and broke off after the gravel had been partly removed although the gravel itself was somewhat damp the bones were dry and powdery ashy gray in color the bones were carried to the hotel central where they were carefully photographed soaked in melted vaseline packed in cotton batting and eventually brought to new haven here they were examined by dr George F. Eaton, curator of osteology in the Peabody Museum. In the meantime, Dr. Bowman had become convinced that the compact gravels of Ayahuaco were of glacial origin. When Dr. Eaton first examined the bone fragments, he was surprised to find among them the bone of a horse. Unfortunately, a careful examination of the photographs taken in Cusco of all the fragments which were excavated by us on July 11th failed to reveal this particular bone. Dr. Bowman, upon being questioned, said that he had dug out one or two more bones in the cliff adjoining our excavation of July 11th and had added these to the original lot. Presumably, this horse bone was one which he had added when the bones were packed. It did not worry him, however, and so sure was he of his interpretation of the gravel beds that he declared he did not care if we had found the bone of a Percheron stallion. He was sure that the age of the vertebrate remains might be provisionally estimated at 20,000 to 40,000 years, until further studies could be made of the geology of the surrounding territory. In an article on the buried wall, Dr. Bowman came to the conclusion that the wall is pre-Inca, 
that its relations to alluvial deposits which cover it indicate its erection before the alluvial slope in which it lies buried was formed, and that it represents the earliest type of architecture at present known in the Cusco Basin. Dr. Eaton's study of the bones brought out the fact that eight of them were fragments of human bones representing at least three individuals. Four were fragments of yama bones, one of the bone of a dog, and three were bovine remains. The human remains agreed, in all essential respects, with the bones of modern Quichuas. Yama and dog might all have belonged to Inca or even more recent times, but the bovine remains presented considerable difficulty. The three fragments were from bones which are among the least characteristic parts of the skeleton. That which was of greater interest was a fragment of a first rib, resembling the first rib of the extinct bison. Since this fragmentary bovine rib was of a form apparently characteristic of bisons and not seen in the domestic cattle of the United States, Dr. Eaton felt that it could not be denied that the material examined suggests the possibility that some species of bison is here represented, yet it would hardly be in accordance with conservative methods to differentiate bison from domestic cattle solely by characters obtained from a study of the first ribs of a small number number of individuals. Although staunchly supporting his theory of the age of the vertebrate remains, Dr. Bowman, in his report on their geological relations, admitted that the weakness of his case lay in the fact that the bovine remains were not sharply differentiated from the bones of modern cattle, and also in the possibility that the bluff in which the bones were found may be faced by younger gravel, and that the bones were found in a gravel veneer deposited during later periods of partial valley filling although it still seems very unlikely. Reports of glacial man in America have come from places as widely separated as California and Argentina. Careful investigation, however, has always thrown doubt on any great age being certainly attributable to any human remains. In view of the fragmentary character of the skeletal evidence, the fact that no proof of great antiquity could be drawn from the characters of the human skeletal parts, and the suggestion made by Dr. Bowman of the possibility that the gravels which contained the bones might be of a later origin than he thought, we determined to make further and more complete investigations in 1912. It was most desirable to clear up all doubts and dissolve all skepticism. I felt, perhaps mistakenly, that while a further study of the geology of the Cusco Basin undoubtedly might lead Dr. Bowman to reverse his opinion, as was expected by some geologists, if it should lead him to confirm his original conclusions, the same skeptics would be likely to continue their skepticism and say he was trying to bolster up his own previous opinions. Accordingly, I believed it preferable to take another geologist, whose independent testimony would give great weight to these conclusions, should he find them confirmed by an exhaustive geological study of the Huatane Valley. I asked Dr. Bowman's colleague, Professor Gregory, to make the necessary studies. At his request, a very careful map of the Huatane Valley was prepared under the direction of Chief Topographer Albert H. Bumstead. Dr. Eaton, who had had no opportunity of seeing Peru, was invited to accompany us and make a study of the bones of modern Peruvian cattle, as well as of any other skeletal remains which might be found. Furthermore, it seemed important to me to dig a tunnel into the Ayahueco hillside at the exact point from which we took the bones in 1911. So I asked Mr. K. C. Held, whose engineering training had been in Colorado, to superintend it. Mr. Held dug a tunnel 11 feet long with a cross section 4.5 by 3 feet into the solid mass of gravel. He expected to have to use timbering, but so firmly packed was the gravel that this was not necessary. No bones or artifacts were found nothing but coarse gravel, uniform in texture and containing no unmistakable evidences of stratification. Apparently, the bones had been in a landslip on the edge of an older, compact gravel mass. 
In his studies of the Cusco Basin, Professor Gregory came to the conclusion that the Ayahueco gravel banks might have been repeatedly buried and re-excavated many times during the past few centuries. He found evidence indicating periodic destruction and rebuilding of some gravel terraces, even within the past 100 years. Accordingly, there was no longer any necessity to ascribe great antiquity to the bones or the wall which we found in the Ayahueco Quebrada. Although the Cusco gravels are believed to have reached their greatest extent and thickness in late Pleistocene times, more recent deposits have, however, been superimposed on top and alongside of them. Surface wash from the bordering slopes, controlled in amount and character by climatic changes, has probably been accumulating continuously since glacial times, and has greatly increased since human occupation began. Geologic data do not require more than a few hundreds of years as the age of the human remains found in the Cusco gravels. But how about the bison? Soon after his arrival in Cusco, Dr. Eaton examined the first ribs of carcasses of beef animals offered for sale in the public markets. He immediately became convinced that the bison was a Peruvian domestic ox. Under the life conditions prevailing in this part of the Andes, and possibly in correlation with the increased action of the respiratory muscles in a rarefied air, domestic cattle occasionally developed first ribs, closely approaching the form observed in bison. Such was the sad end of the bison and the Cusco man, who at one time I thought might be 40,000 years old, and now believed to have been 200 years old, perhaps. The word Ayahueco in Quichua means the Valley of Dead Bodies, or Dead Man's Gulch. There is a story that it was used as a burial place for plague victims in Cusco, not more than three generations ago. End of Section 13 Recording by William Tomko